Welcome back. So we've been talking about sparsity and compressed sensing and how different norms give you different solutions to underdetermined uh, systems of equations. So now I want to illustrate these ideas in code in Python. Okay, so specifically what we're, what we're dealing with here is this underdetermined system of equations y equals theta s, and we have essentially a small measurement vector y and a high dimensional unknown vector s, and we're going to solve for s that satisfies this equations. Okay, this system of equations. So we know that this could come from the compressed sensing problem where we have y equals some matrix C times some matrix psi times some vector S, where psi times S maybe uh, X is a high dimensional vector representing an image, so a million dimensional vector in pixel space. S could be its Fourier transform, so a sparse million dimensional vector in Fourier domain would be S, and C would be this uh, sparse measurement operator that would measure individual pixels uh, of our high dimensional uh, image x. And, and so y would be a subsample of maybe 10% of the pixels in our high dimensional image x. And we're trying to find the sparsest vector s in the Fourier domain that is consistent with those measurements. Okay, so generally speaking, <clears throat> y is a known uh, measurement, theta is a known matrix, and s is an unknown vector that we're trying to solve for. And we want s to be uh, as sparse as possible, at least for the compressed sensing problem. Okay, and so uh, the setup here is pretty simple. We we measure y, we we know what theta is, and we're going to solve for s. And there are many different ways of of solving for s because this y vector is small. In fact, here we're going to set this up in Python so that uh, my my s vector and my s x vector are a thousand dimensional. Okay, so n is a thousand, the dimension of of s. My output measurement y is 200 dimensional, so I'm only me measuring 20% uh, of this, this high dimensional vector x. So y is 200 dimensional, s is 1000 dimensional. And so what that means is that this system of equations is underdetermined. There's not enough information in y to uniquely determine a solution s. In fact, there are in general infinitely many solutions the s that would possibly solve this system of equations. And so we have an enormous choice uh, out of all of these infinitely many solutions s, which one do we choose uh, to solve for this equation? Okay, and so there's lots of different ways of solving for these, and I'm gonna work out two uh, variations here. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna show the least square solution. This is kind of the solution you're used to uh, that, that you, you would usually solve for in an underdetermined system of equations. You would basically try to solve for an S that satisfies this equation, an S that satisfies this equation here that has the minimum L2 norm on S, that has basically the smallest radius of S in its high dimensional vector space, the smallest norm of S. So, so that would be one solution is the minimum L2 norm solution or the least square solution. And you would solve for this uh, by computing the pseudo inverse of theta and multiplying it by Y. So you'd pseudo inverse theta and you'd say S equals pseudo inverse of theta times Y. This pseudo inverse, just for those of you who are interested, you would compute this using the singular value decomposition, which is in chapter one uh, and another, another video series. You would take the SVD of theta, and then you'd invert each matrix, uh, matrix by matrix, and that would be easy because those matrices are unitary and diagonal. Okay, but long story short, um, you can compute the minimum two norm uh, solution S that satisfies this equa equation. But what we're interested in for compressed sensing and for sparsity, we want the sparsest uh, vector S possible. And so what we actually want to do is minimize the L1 norm of S, because I've told you before that if we find a, an S that has a really, really small L1 norm, it's probably going to be a sparse vector. So the L1 norm promotes sparsity. And the way we do that is we try to find the minimum one norm of S such that Y equals theta S is true. Okay, that's how we write this as an optimization problem. We want uh, to find the, the the we want to find s that has the minimum one norm but still satisfies this equation. Okay, so I'm going to code up both of these in Python. We're going to run it and we're going to see what it what answer we get. Okay, and this is going to take a little while generally to run these optimizations in Python. Okay, good. So we set up the problem here. We have our theta matrix, uh, which is a Gaussian random 
matrix of size p by n, and y is also a random, uh, randomly sampled vector. Basically, I don't need these to be anything but random, and I can still, because it's an underdetermined system, I can still solve for a sparse s that satisfies this. Okay, and then to find the L1 norm solution here, what we're going to do is um, this is relatively simple. Um, we're going to define the L1 norm, and then we're going to minimize the L1 norm uh, with an initial condition using uh, this SLSQP optimization algorithm uh, with the constraints given in this constraints line up here. Okay, and you can download this code from uh, databookuw.com and kind of work through all of these and you know look look through each line by line. But basically, what we're doing is we're solving this minimization here. We're finding uh, the minimum one norm vector s that satisfies this system of equations. Okay, and that's what I'm saying here. So uh, we want theta x minus y to be minimized uh, to be equal to zero, and we want to minimize the one norm. Good. So I'm going to run all of this, uh, and it might take a little while. Yep, still thinking. And then it's also really, really easy to find the least square solution by just computing the p inverse, the pseudo inverse of theta uh, times y. So this is kind of a built-in function, the pseudo inverse um, into uh, NumPy's linear algebra package. So uh, np.linalg.p inverse gets this. And then you can multiply it by your y vector uh, to get the least squares s. Okay, so my L1 norm uh, solution is still thinking. This doesn't, you know, this is not super fast to run these optimizations, uh, but it is eventually going to converge. So it's going to minimize the L1. Uh, and it, apparently I initialized this with the least square solution. So I'm starting from the, the L2 solution as my initialization, and then we run this uh, minimization to converge to the L1 minimum solution. Now, I've actually run this ahead of time, so I'm just going to show you what these plots, uh, kind of the output while this is running. And I'm going to plot everything all at once. So what we have here, um, kind of on this top plot right here, is uh, the L1 solution. And next to it, what we have is the L2 solution, okay? And the top plot, the blue plot, and the red plot have a thousand elements. And so this is literally a plot of S, of the entries of S, you know, S1, S2, S3, S4, all the way up to S1000. And the same thing in red here for the least square solution. And so right off the bat, what you notice is that the least square solution, most of these values are much, much smaller, but almost all of them are non-zero. So this does have a smaller kind of radius in the L2 sense, but it doesn't have sparsity at all. These are very, very uh, non-sparse solutions in red. In blue, this S vector, um, it's a little hard to see on this screen, but these values are much, much larger and they're much spikier. And if you zoomed in, what you'd find is that most of these values are zero and occasionally they spike up to these large values, then they go down to zero, then they spike down to a large value. And so this blue solution that solved the one norm is very sparse. Most of its entries are zero. And you can see that here in these histograms. So these are literally histograms or counts of how many of the values of S uh, were 0 or 0 0.5 or 0 0.1 or negative 0.05 and things like that for the least squares and for the L1 solutions. And so what you see here is that in the least squared solution, most of these values are distributed away from 0. So most of the values are non-zero, which is what you expect uh, from the least square solution. But in the L1 solution, there's this huge peak here at, um, at zero. And what this shows you is that almost all of the values of this S vector are very, very nearly zero. And then only a small number of them, only a couple hundred, are distributed out here far away from zero. And this actually makes sense, because remember, this small vector y had 200 entries, and this large unknown vector S had 1,000 entries. And so I can solve this system of equations with approximately 200 non-zero entries in S. So I can probably find a solution to this with 200 non-zero entries of S and about 800 zero entries. And that's almost exactly what we see here. This is 0, 200, 400, 600. The top would be about 800. And so what we have here is almost exactly 800 zero entries in S 
and the rest of this system of equations is being solved with those other 200 non-zero entries. So this effectively shows that when you do this minimization min penalizing the one norm of S, you get a very, very sparse solution, but when you penalize the two norm, which is the least square solution, uh, your, your S vector is not sparse at all, okay? So uh, what, that's something I really, really wanted to show you is this idea that for these underdetermined systems of equations, there are multiple solutions. Both of these solutions actually satisfy this system of equations, but only by penalizing the one norm do you actually recover a sparse solution where most of the entries of S are zero. Okay, thank you.